How do you do? Have you ever found yourself trapped in a pattern you can't break free of? You know that feeling when you're on that website too long? Or perhaps there are certain thought cycles you can't break free of. You hear the same lies over and over that you're not good enough. Or there's no point in getting up today. Today we'll hear the story of a woman named Natalie who fought the same destructive patterns throughout her life but learned to do so with God by her side when her heart and mind and life were unshackled. Natalie! Where are you going? I don't want to watch them kill my brother. Get inside! Don't touch me! Get inside, young lady, right now! I'm not going to kill him, Nat. They're, they're going to help. But you have to stay here. Why? He has a gun. Brian wouldn't hurt me. He has a gun. Step out of the car, slowly. What? What is going on? Lay down on your stomach. Uh... Now! You need to come with us, Brian. Can I just say hi to my... It's my parents' anniversary. They know I... you're here. They've asked us to come. This is Unshackled, dramatizing true life stories produced in Chicago by Pacific Garden Mission. Chicago is beloved for its lakefront natural beauty, wealth of culture, and warm Midwestern demeanor. And yet, the homeless population is abundant. Pacific Garden Mission has been serving this population since 1877. Every day, hundreds of men, women, and children of all ages and backgrounds seek help, shelter, food, and hope. This gives us an opportunity to introduce people to the love of God and the hope we have in Him, which is what this program celebrates. Now for broadcast around the earth, here is program number 3554 in the series Unshackled, the program that makes you face yourself and think. The woman in our story would fight loneliness and depression for many years. This is the story of her journey towards finding fellowship and freedom. The true story of a woman we're calling Natalie, right now on Unshackled. I was born in the great cheese state of Wisconsin to parents who loved me and my brother Brian. Still, the noise in our house often reached a high decibel due to my mother's volatile mood swings. We grew up in a suburb, a compromise for my urban mother and my country father. In fact, my childhood was marked by compromise. Mom was Catholic and Dad was Lutheran, so we did a little of both. I wonder if God felt like that was a compromise. I never knew what would set Mom off, so I compromised by hiding. Early on, I developed a high level of social anxiety. Hon, you, you didn't tell me my sister called. She says she's been trying to get a hold of me. Well, I am not your personal secretary, Dan. Oh, you don't need to get so... Need to get what? I, I was just saying it'd be nice if you could pass along the message. Well, it would be nice if you could do anything to help around here. How about that, huh? All right, do you want me to take the kids to the park? Ah, uh, I got it. Uh, all right. Well, then I'm, I'm going to keep working. Okay. Natalie, come on! We're leaving! Mommy? Yes? Please don't make me go. Oh, it'll be fun. There'll be other kids there. Oh, please, Mommy, can't I just stay in my room? Please. Ah, uh, well, all right, sweetheart. We're leaving! Natalie's staying in her room! Again? The happiest moment of my childhood was picking out my own cat, a gift from my great uncle. Frisky was my first friend, and she taught me what incredible companions animals can be. Though I did well in school and was the valedictorian all through high school, I had very low self-confidence. By middle school, I was overweight and always picked last for teams. The day of the presidential physical fitness testing was always the worst day of the year. Why did the president care how many sit-ups I could do? Go! 
Come on, kids. It's the 100 meter dash, not the 100 meter drag. Pick up your feet. Let's go. Nice, Eric. Lean, lean in, Casey. Good, good. Come on, Andy. You got it. All right. Well done. Well done, everybody. Hey, grab some water. Wait, wait, wait. Who's back there? Is that Natalie? Come on, Natalie, run! I'm, I'm trying. Move your feet! All right, time to go get changed. Go on in, kids. I'll wait for Natalie. Come on, come on, finish it up! All right, all right, good job. Thank you. But I really wish you'd try harder, Natalie. That was... I was trying. Not just when you're here, but in general. We gotta work on your... I want you to be healthy, Natalie. I never want to see... Never want to see what? You're the, you're the kind of kid we worry could be at risk for suicide someday. We just gotta... Keep working on getting you in shape. Together. I've never forgotten that he said that. The problem was eating was one of the only things that felt good. I couldn't wait to get home and eat junk food in the peace and quiet of my room. That was my escape from the miseries of middle school. What? Can we come in? I'm busy. Come on, Ned, open up. We know you've been wanting a dog for a long time, and, and your dad and I have been talking... We know it's been a tough year, and... Oh, my. Oh, my. Now, Are you, you let serious? Me just... Listen to what your mom has to say, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, now, aren't you glad that you opened up the door? Magic was the first dog who saved my life. High school was better in the friend department. In addition to magic, I made some good friends at my new school but I still suffered from anxiety and my perfectionist tendencies made for some very late nights. Somehow, we made it through high school. I went on to attend college in Wisconsin where I set my sights on medical school. My brother went to the same college. In high school, he had also been a stellar student like me and an amazing athlete, not like me. But as an undergrad, his world began to crumble. He drank heavily, got a DUI, and even attempted suicide. He was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. One of the scariest moments came over a summer on my parents' wedding anniversary. I don't understand why you think that. We talked to one of his classmates who was concerned. Not that he has a gun, but what he'd do with it. Can you just trust us, Natalie? I do. I do trust you. That just doesn't... Of course, it's hard to imagine. I mean, he's your brother, but... We've told I... him we wanted you kids to come home to celebrate our anniversary. And we've also told the police that he's on his way home. So they'll be ready to... Well, to... Take... To, to what? Well, to take him to, into custody. To take him into custody and conduct an evaluation at the hospital. And they did. An entire SWAT team was waiting for my brother when he got home. Through it all, I kept working harder and harder at my studies. After college, I was diagnosed with depression. My family all dealt with mental health issues, but we didn't know how to help one another. My plan was still to apply for medical school, but I had absolutely no confidence. My first two years went well. I was able to focus on learning and persevere. But things fell apart when we went into our rotations, and I had to actually put what I'd learned in the books into practice. Natalie, can you come in here and tie off the knot in this patient? Oh, well, no thank you. Do you know how? No. I mean, yes. But... Yes, I know you know how. You did very well on the surgical exam. Yeah, well, that's very different. Just grab hold of the suture. You should do it to be safe. 
I was so afraid I would hurt someone. It didn't matter how much I knew if I believed I was a fraud. I decided to take a medical leave three months into my third year. The dean of the school connected me with a doctor who would become my therapist and friend for many years. Natalie, what made you want to be a doctor? I wanted to help people. Oh, that's very generous. Well, not entirely. I also wanted to be imp impressive. Being a doctor seemed like something I could do really well at. Do you perceive yourself as doing well at it? No, obviously not. So sorry. I wish you could climb into my head and explain what I'm feeling. Well, that would make me the world's best therapist. Still, it is better that I help you learn to identify your own thoughts and feelings. We just have to focus on differentiating between the truth and the lies. I tried going back to med school, and I knew within a month that I had to withdraw. The pressure was just too much. All of those hard-earned A's had amounted to nothing, and I was left with a struggling family, a huge, now worthless student loan, and an even bigger amount of doubt and sadness. I felt like a failure. My dream of being a doctor was gone. We'll continue with Natalie's story in just a moment. Here's the president of Pacific Garden Mission, Phil Kwiatkowski. Thanks, Timothy. Our ministry here at Pacific Garden Mission cares for the bodies, hearts, and minds of those in need. We hope that everyone who enters our doors will come to know the transforming love and power of Jesus. We also work to provide care for immediate needs like food and clothing. And we could always use your help. We strive to serve a hot, nutritious breakfast, lunch and dinner free of charge for any hungry man, woman, or child who walks through our doors. We serve approximately 2,000 meals a day. Send your gift or check to Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607, or call 312-429-6700 to discuss further opportunities to serve and partner with us. That's 312-429-6700. Without medical school to keep me focused, I turned my attention to those things I had previously avoided in favor of my studies, namely men. I made many terrible choices, and I'm grateful now for the ways in which God protected me during that season, though I didn't know it at the time. In the middle of all that, during Christmas, my parents gave me and my brother each a check to do with as we liked. Mom and Dad go to bed? Yeah. What you doing out here? Just looking at the Christmas tree. I like the one they picked out this year. Mm, me too. Hey, I, I just wanted to... Well, I want you to have my check. What? The check Mom and Dad gave me. I want you to have it. No, that's yours. It's mine to do with what I want. I want to give it to you. Brian, you need that money. I know you're still looking for work, and that could help know last you while... I what a hard time you've been having, and I, I want you to have it, okay? You, you're such a good sister to me while I was at my worst. Will you just let me... Will you just accept this? With Brian's gift, I was able to make one of the best purchases of my life. A tiny, shelty puppy named Ellie. She was adorable, and also a handful. She was bursting with energy, and I had no idea how to train her. I had a cousin, Meg, who was a dog trainer. I hadn't talked to her in a while, but I gave her a call to see if she might be willing to come spend a weekend with me and Ellie. It's okay! It's okay, Ellie! Shh! Remember the commands. Oh, um, stay there, Ellie! Stay there! Ellie, stay. Wow. Good girl, Ellie. Good girl. You're incredible. Just experienced. You've got yourself a real ball of fire in this one. Yeah, well, she was the cutest and tiniest dog in the litter. 
Ah, that is so not how to pick a dog for future reference. What do you mean? Well, this is what you call a race car dog. With this kind of dog, you have to be so exact with everything you do. If you make the slightest mistake or veer from her routine by a millisecond, she's gonna go off the handle. Is that how a race car is? I don't know. I've never driven one. <laughs> 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 But that's what I hear. It makes me think about well, I don't know if you believe in God or, but you know, God actually designed our relationship with our dog to mirror the relationship He wants with us. You know the heel command we've taught Ellie. Yes. She's supposed to walk where you walk, turn where you turn, and sit automatically when you stop. Both eyes, both ears on you. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about in the Bible when he says, "Follow me." Hmm. We're supposed to walk where we see him walk, turn when we feel him saying to turn, and stop when he pauses. Just like Ellie, getting her focus off of all those things she wants that can hurt her, like the cars she likes to chase. Anyway, have you have you ever thought about how much Jesus actually loves you? Not really. Where is she? Do you like those shoes? Ellie, no! Those are my winter boots. I need those. That night, Meg asked if I wanted to ask Jesus into my heart, but I told her no. I just couldn't believe he could love me like that, broken as I was. Time went on, and I was so depressed. I didn't understand why Meg kept talking to me and calling. Long after Ellie was trained, at first I thought she was crazy. But over time, those ideas took hold of me. Eventually, I asked her for a Bible. Two years later, I opened it. After that, I joined a local fellowship group, and then on November 18th, at my first Bible study. I asked Jesus into my heart. What? Oh, that's, that's fantastic! Yeah. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, I went to the Bible study and I didn't know anyone, so I was real nervous. But I went, and they were studying the Book of John. It was the first time I read it for myself. And so good. It said that God sent Jesus so that we, so that I, could have eternal life, and. I don't know. I just started crying, and I prayed with someone, and I have it now. I think I have what you have, and I, <coughs> Ellie, sit. Wow! Sounds like a lot has changed over there. A lot had, but not everything. I thought once I became a believer, my life was supposed to be better. You know, trouble-free. I was supposed to be stronger. When Meg's mom died, she demonstrated incredible joy even in the face of hardship and loss. Why couldn't I be like that? Of all things, God would use Ellie to show me His heart. What's up? How are you feeling this week? I had to call you because I just got back from the most incredible hike with Ellie. Oh yeah? Yeah. Today was my only day off in forever, and I had so much to do. But I felt God drawing me to spend the day with Him. I took Ellie to the park, and you know how she is with cars. <laughs> yes. So I had let her off her leash earlier, and I wanted to give her that freedom. But when we got near the road, I had to work so much harder to keep her focused on me. And suddenly, I realized I'm just like Ellie. Interesting. Do care to share? Why, thanks. I shall. <laughs> I chase things like overeating and overachieving or attention from guys because I want them the way Ellie chases cars. But God knows these things are dangerous. I need Him to keep me safe and to keep me focused on Him despite my circumstances. Yeah. And then it hit me how much I love Ellie. She's always one step away from flying off the handle. I'm always having to manage her behavior, yet I still love her so much. And I thought that as I hugged and squeezed her right after I narrowly avoided her chasing a car, and then I felt God say, "I love you way more than you love Ellie, no matter what you have ever done or will do."
I went on to get baptized at my church. Before the baptism, I felt God calling me to have tea with him. Seriously. So that's what I did. I had a little London fog out in the church lobby, and this is the verse he gave me. Isaiah 49, verses 15 and 16. Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. In that moment, I was awestruck by the depth of the promise that God would never leave me. I was engraved upon the palms of his hands. Perhaps this had even more meaning in light of my relationship to my mother, with whom my relationship had always been fraught. Throughout my life, my mother had been verbally abusive to me, and it continued to be a toxic relationship into my adulthood. Dr. Epperson suggested I ask my parents to communicate with me through my father, a request which my mother chose not to respect. I remember the day I realized I needed to put distance between us. I was over at my parents' for dinner. Ugh! Dan, I'm gonna kill you! Except she didn't say it that nice, if you know what I mean. What were you thinking packing this food up like this? Well, was the lid not on all the way? Uh... No, it obviously wasn't on all the way. You're such an idiot. I don't know how you think it's okay to live like this. I felt like I was ten years old again. I wanted to put my hands over my ears and run into my bedroom. I'm leaving. What? No, Natalie! Thanks for dinner. Dan, now look what you've done. Your own daughter can't even stand to be with us. I'll never forget the look on my dad's face as I walked out. I talked to Meg and to Dr. Epperson. They supported my decision to limit communications with my parents, except for true emergencies. I felt peace, but it was an extremely painful decision. I turned to my old habits, eating alone in my home until I was completely stuffed. That was how I knew to medicate the pain. I grew distant, I stopped returning Meg's calls, I grew deeply depressed and isolated myself from those who loved me. Until one day I learned that Meg had been in a terrible accident. Hey, Nat. I saw on social media that... I fell off my horse. I wish you'd felt like you could call me. You haven't called me back in weeks. I know, but this is... I'm so sorry, Meg. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I was so afraid I wasn't going to be able to say goodbye. I'm not going anywhere. But do I have to get hurt to hear from you? Meg made a new rule. We could only talk if I called her. And just like I'd had to set boundaries with my family, Meg had to set boundaries with me. Not long after this, my Auntie Pat was diagnosed with cancer. She had also severed ties with my parents. I stepped in to care for her. When the end came near, I asked her if she wanted to see my dad, and she said yes. Then I realized that meant I would see him too, for the first time in two and a half years. Did you and Aunt Pat have a nice visit? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we did. It's hard to see her like that, isn't it? It is. It really is. But I'm so glad I came. I'm glad you came, too. Dad, it hasn't been easy being cut off from you. I hate it, Nat. I hate it so much. I had to do it because of Mom, but my memories with you are still some of the best of my life. I'll never forget attending the Civil War book club together. Remember those snacks? The hardtack was disgusting. I told you I could never be a soldier. You did. And going to baseball games. We never won. But I loved every minute. I miss you, Dad. I love you so much. And if you'd be willing, I'd like to start spending time together. Just the two of us. Would that be okay with you? Nat, nothing would make me happier. My aunt went to be with Jesus not long after that. 
It was sad for our family, but it marked a turning point for me in my walk with God. It was the first time I had gone through something difficult with God, with the joy that I'd seen in my cousin Meg. Without falling into depression and overeating, God was giving me his strength. And that was good timing to learn that, because soon after, I lost my very best friend, Ellie. After fighting health complications, we finally had to put her to sleep on a sunny spring day. Ellie, you have taught me what it really means to have joy, whatever my circumstances. I thank you, God, for this amazing dog who you used to teach me so much about your love for me. Thank you. Goodbye, Ellie. And so I press on. Life isn't perfect, but I'm learning not to be a perfectionist. God wants me to be free. I'm working on my eating, and I've lost 50 pounds. Meg helped me pick out a new dog, Ephraim, and it's amazing how God's hand was in that choice as well. Even though I miss my Ellie, he's absolutely a perfect match for me. And I'm already seeing things God wants to teach me through him as he did with Ellie. I never thought God could break the chains of depression and food addiction in my life, but if he can do that, and he is, who knows what else is in store. I am truly on a great adventure, and Jesus is my guide and Savior. If you need help breaking the chains of addiction in your life and choosing Christ, get in touch with Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607.